Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. Let's talk about NXT from November the 15th, 2022. Solid enough episode of NXT. A lot of noteworthy stuff to discuss. Uh, nothing really on the news and notes except uh, HBK, old HB Sizzle, has been catching up on his TNA wrestling. Because he came up with this crazy ass Iron Survivor match. So let's talk about that first. The Iron Survivor match, a new match type that is seemingly the Frankenstein monster of three other match types. The King of the Mountain match from TNA Wrestling. The old Championship Scramble match from WWE and apparently the Royal Rumble. Where it's 25 minutes, that's the length of the match. Five competitors, two will start at an interval, I think it said two or three minutes. Another person will enter. Uh, you gain a pinfall via pin or submission. If you pin, you get one point. If you are pinned, then you have to go into the penalty box for 90 seconds. Um, they didn't say whether these will be title matches or not, but it will be two matches. It will be one men's, one women's. Okay. Uh, I'm all for taking chances. NXT is the place to take a chance. My problem, penalty box. That's... Penalty box. Always a bad decision. Anytime you have to put somebody in a penalty box, if they get pinned or submitted or something like that, it's always a mistake. It, look, this match is interesting because it behooves you to get into the match early. So unlike other matches like the Royal Rumble or the Elimination Chamber, where coming in later actually benefits you, coming in early actually benefits you here because you have more time to collect pinfalls. So that's interesting. You know, now you're going to have people who are going to want to come in first and you get punished by coming in last. So it's like a double punishment. If you're coming in last, then you have less time than other people to collect pinfalls. And you could also be pinned and be sent to the penalty box and which wastes your time even further. So the maximum amount of time is 25 minutes, which uh, is the Iron Man concept. That's also a part of this is the, uh, the points. So the match itself is, I don't hate it. I want to see it in action. Um, it has the potential to create great drama, especially as the climb, the, the clock ticks down. It fits the deadline pay-per-view uh, concept with the ticker and everything. So that works. They're building. But of course, we were told that the gimmick pay-per-views were going away. And now we're just getting different gimmick pay-per-views, <laughs> you know, just different ones. You know, we're going to get rid of gimmick pay-per-views, but we're just going to create new gimmicks for for the, for the pay-per-views, whatever. So, on, on its face, it's fine. Um, it is definitely TNA tier um, with, the, with the penalty box. If we can get rid of that penalty box, I think we might be okay. But I think they're just going to have penalty boxes so people could jump off of it. That's my... Which is what they did in TNA. It, it also, it just seems like it's going to crowd the ring. You know, with those boxes there. It's like it's going to crowd the ring. It's going to be hella crap in the way. I don't like the penalty box. I'm sorry. Unless it, you know, you want to put them in a shark cage above the ring, like for a manager or something like that. That makes sense. But putting wrestlers in penalty boxes, I don't, um, I've never been a fan of that. I don't like that. It's dumb. We could have kept it like the championship scramble where, you know, pinfalls and submissions are counted. And then at the end, whoever got the most wins. It's that simple. You don't need to put people on the penalty box. You can make this match simpler than this. Um, but I, I like it, uh, generally speaking. We'll see how it actually turns out. But on paper, it seems to be okay. Um, the uh, people entering in intervals is fine, too. As long as the intervals are not too long. I don't remember what it was. I think it was like, uh, I don't want to say two minutes, but maybe three. But um, it ought to be fine, I guess. So... I'm guessing these are going to be number one contenders matches and they're going to have other kinds of matches as um, matches on the card. Hopefully, hopefully these are contenders matches and not championship matches because they would kind of be lame to switch the titles or anything like that via the iron survivor challenge rather than uh, beating the actual champion in the middle of the ring or whatever, you know. So, the Iron Survivor Challenge is fine. Um, it's definitely TNA tier. But it's not as bad as, you know, the Reverse Battle Royal or 
that goofy king of the mountain match, which there's, you know, typically speaking, when it comes to a gimmick match in wrestling, the fewer rules, the better. You know, <laughs> the more simple you can make it, the better. And this match is pretty simple. You know, whoever has the most pinfalls at the end of 25 minutes wins. It's the simple. It's very simple. But the penalty box complicates things. And to me, it seems goofy to put people on the penalty box. All right. Um, we've all seen the performance center class with well, the females from the performance center class. And that Jay Gentile, uh, the Icelandic soccer player. I put it in a community tab if you have not seen it. She blew my mind, dog. That's all I'm going to say about that. Blow my mind. I, I, I want to see her in action. I want to see her in action. I want to see what she got. You know, I want to see. Her, I want to see that thing move. You feel me? All right, match one: Braun Breaker versus Von Wagner. Um, I want to complain a little bit about the lack of introductions. And what I mean by the lack of introductions, what I mean is I was a perusing through Twitter, and um, somebody had some old footage of like demolition working house shows, and you get the uh, the total combined weight of 400 and yada, yada, yada pounds. And they didn't have a place they were from, but you know, they announced the total combined weight. And I was like, man, I remember, I missed those days of, you know, guys being announced by their weight, their hometown. You know, it made it feel like it was a legitimate fight. Like in boxing, you announced the weights and where they, where, where they come from UFC, they announced their weights and where they come from. WWE just announces names now. They don't even announce, you know, where these guys come from. They don't even bother to make it up sometimes. And then what's even worse is when it's inconsistent. Like, they'll announce uh, names and weights for some people, but not for others. And then they'll do names and weights for some matches, and then not for others. It seems like you really take a lot of the drama out of the introduction, the build-up, when you take out the names of the towns and the weights and, and stuff like that, more things that you can add to their introductions, the better. And I think that's what um, boxing and UFC have really shown. Like Triple H likes to take elements from boxing and UFC, you know, with the press conferences and everything. That's something that you need to take. Like boxing will tell you, you know, everything about the guy, the, the guy's record, how many knockouts he's got, you know, what championships he, he's won. Yeah, it just give it to you the whole nine yards. And it really builds up for when you announce his name. And it, it educates people who might not have known who this guy is. If you're seeing him for the first time, it's a it's a good way of doing things. Now, if WWE did those title cards like they do on Raw, where it's like those things on the side, if they did those for everybody that had, you know, hometown, weight, championships that they won, if that was consistent then that would be a good enough way of, okay, we don't have to announce it. We can just do this little thing on the side. It says, you know, Seth Rollins from Davenport, Iowa, weighs 220 pounds, former WWE champion, former yada, 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 former yada, yada, yada. You know, that way you can be caught up. But um, this just naked, you know, in this corner, Brian Breaker, like, okay. In this corner, Von Wagner, like, okay. Like us. Um, anyway, this match was fine. It was actually one of the better Von Wagner matches that I've ever seen. Uh, he was, you know, wrestled big guy style in this match. He's pretty hard hitting, but Brian Breaker is just something else. You know, just imagine if he was on the main roster and all the zombies. He's not ready yet. He's not. People did that, though. When Brian first started, people were like, he's not ready. He shouldn't be the champion yet. And I was one of those people. It was, it was a little too soon when he got his first title shot. It was too soon. But um, look at what he's grown into. Just by them giving him the ball and letting him run with it, he's grown into a very excellent NXT champion. Better than most of the black and gold era NXT champions, too. Don't at me. Um, the finish comes with a single spear. Which is fine when, unless you are, you know, going to grumble about Von Wagner choke slamming Braun Breaker on the steps and that not being the finish or not even leading into the finish. It's just like I know he's a kid and all, but can we save those bumps if they're not going to be the finish? You know, that's whiplash on his neck and stuff. Like let's uh, let's spare those. You feel me? All right. So uh, Alba Fire. 
she did a promo backstage. She said the only reason she was not the champion right now is due to toxic attraction. And that, uh, but she doesn't have the numbers game. You being Mandy Rose, she being Mandy Rose, rather. Pronouns, pal. But uh, Mandy Rose doesn't have the numbers game anymore. And the toxic empire is about to burn to the ground. That's what she, that's what she thought. Uh, Mandy Rose cut a promo later saying that she heard every prediction in the book over the past year about her not being ready, her not being able to wrestle, her not being able to uh, carry the brand. But here she stands, the women's NXT champion, and she's a once in a billion superstar. And she was doing a little bit of a Nikki Bella kind of cosplay here where she did look a lot like Nikki Bella. If I you know from if I wasn't paying attention, I would be like, wait a minute. Of course you never really get them mixed up considering how buxom Mandy Rose is. And yes I use the word buxom. But um uh, you, you know you're not gonna ever get them mixed up. And plus Mandy is actually not bad in the ring while Nikki Bella is mm, let's let's just leave that one open. So this brings us to the to the main event. Mandy Rose versus Alba Fire. Last woman standing for the NXT Championship. This match was pretty good. Uh, they did a good job of showing that, you know, Mandy's tough on her own. And that Mandy can get it, can handle it on her own. A uh, really wild swanton bond from the top onto the floor is pretty ugly. Uh, almost broke her neck. Uh, Alba Fire just nailed Mandy Rose. Uh, the finish. Um... Mandy Rose breaks out, well, Alba Fire breaks out a ladder. Climbs to the top, lays Mandy Rose on it. She's going to swanton bomb Mandy Rose through the announce table to win the match. When Isla Dawn climbs up behind her, spits mist in her face, and shoves her off the announce, off the ladder. She crashes through the announce table. Mandy Rose gets to, back to her feet before the count of ten. Therefore, the winner of the match is Mandy Rose. So Mandy Rose does not win this match clean either. Considering she's a heel, doesn't really matter that much. I know it, it does bother some people that heels are not winning clean, but, you know, I get it in so much as Alba Fire did so much work in isolating Toxic Attraction only for a random Isla Dawn to attack. Um, and I get that. You know, I get how that might frustrate people because it's like consistently interference in these matches. But uh, Mandy Rose is not connected to Alba Fire. I mean, not connected to Isla Dawn, you know, and Isla Dawn's character doesn't really fit in Toxic Attraction either. So they got an NXT UK thing, I guess, going or a personal thing between Alba Fire and Isla Dawn going. And you know what? I'm perfectly fine with this. As I was watching this match, though, I really was thinking, like, what's next for Mandy? Because I would say she's probably going to drop the belt near the end of the year. Um, so my question would be, who's going to, of course, who's going to drop the belt to? I'm thinking it's more or less Nikita Lyons now. Um, I thought it was going to be Roxanne Perez before, but now it's looking more like Nikita Lyons than ever. But what do you do with Mandy after that when you call her up to the main roster? Do you wait until after WrestleMania? Because I think that she is a good contender to win the Royal Rumble. Now, clearly, I, I have said for months now that Rhea Ripley should win the Royal Rumble, and I stand by that. But I think if you're going to have a solid number two, I would go with Mandy Rose. And I think Mandy Rose um, winning the Royal Rumble with the help of Toxic Attraction, of course, would be excellent storytelling and would skyrocket her back to where she would be you know, at the top of the division and give her a nice little opportunity to build a run um, for WrestleMania or she can win the Elimination Chamber. But I definitely think that Mandy Rose is needed, especially on SmackDown, where they definitely need um, personality and persona. But I don't think Toxic Attraction can really work on SmackDown due to it being on network television and the character is being somewhat sexualized, so it probably have to be raw. Um, but I definitely think that she could be used on one of those top rosters right now. Alba Fire could probably be used on one of those top rosters too, but um, I'm just deeply concerned about her promo ability. Um, her wrestling ability is fine. Her look is actually not too bad. She can get rid of that damn uh, flannel shirt around her waist. I don't know what's up with that, but 
she can get rid of that. She be, she might be okay. But Alba Fire is becoming like Cameron Grimes, where you just can't win the big one, and then you know we're just gonna we're gonna hold on to him in NXT, even though we're never gonna give them anything. So I don't know. Maybe it's time for Alba Fire to, to vacate, you know, and to make her move to SmackDown or something like that, which seems to be the international show where they're gonna do a little bit of everything. It ought to be fine. But um, Isla Dawn, we've been, I've been well, I've been, I'm about to say we, but I've been waiting on Isla Dawn, Isla Dawn to pop up for a while now. We all thought she was going to be either scripts or she was going to pop up in uh, Schism. But her, having her debut on her own, she got a good reaction, so people knew who she was. Um, I'm, I'm not certain everybody knows. Like, I'm pretty sure people listening to the sound of my voice have probably never seen an Isla Dawn match in their lives. I've never seen an Isla Dawn promo. Um, but she was a jobber in NXT UK for a long time. And then out of nowhere, she became like this crazy pagan witch. It was a slow burn. <laughs> but she was one of Shawn Michaels' favorite characters there. He, he used her routinely. Um, so he's definitely going to go back to that. Now, it, this leads to, of course, another critique. How many spooky characters do we really need on one show? Like, we got Schism already. You know, how many more spooky characters do you really need? There's it's seemingly a favorite of wrestlers today. Everybody wants to be some undead witch uh, with superpowers or whatever. We got too many of those. Um, but Isla Dawn is pretty good with it. You know, and I think it comes stems from where her real beliefs. So it might be fine, you know, but I do think we need a moratorium on, you know, witchy supernatural characters i've been off the magic train for a while i think we need to chill with, with it before we start having like 90 percent of the roster either the boogeyman or papa shango we and i don't need everybody to have superpowers um as far as in-ring wrestling is concerned man uh, isla dawn is mid like she's not the best wrestler in the world but she's not the worst she really just knows how to work her gimmick which is the um, important thing because that's what wwe is at least when Vince's era you work your gimmick in Triple H's era, where he's going to try to make these women wrestle 25-minute matches or whatever the hell, I, I don't know if, how it's going to work. <laughs> you know, I'm really concerned about that. But um, all in all, um, it's going to be fine, I guess. All right, so Brian Breaker was backstage. I forgot to talk about this because I wasn't paying attention. Brian Breaker was backstage when he ran into J.D. McDonough, uh, the human bobblehead, who said that he'll never be done with him. Uh, Brian Breaker was also backstage when Apollo Crews says that uh, he wanted Brian Breaker to watch what he does because when one challenge ends, another begins. This brings us to the third match on the show, which was uh, J.D. McDonough versus Apollo Crews. Um, this was a pretty good match. You know, very solid contest between these two guys. Apollo Crews wins with an elevated spine buster. Uh, Brian Breaker comes out to face Apollo Crews, which tells us that Apollo Crews is next in line for the title. All right. All right. That's fine. Um, I, I don't, I don't hate it. Um, <laughs> we need, we need something better out of Apollo Cruz for sure. We need, we need this feud to have some heat. So we probably need Apollo to turn heel. Like I definitely like this really needs for Apollo to turn heel. In fact, Apollo just needs to turn heel, not just for this match, but he just needs to turn heel period. In order to be interesting, he cannot be um, whatever this uh, the Oracle of NXT. He just can't be that guy. That guy sucks. You know, you you can clearly do something else. So um, JD McDonough is finally out of the title picture. Praise be to God. All right, Zoe Stark. Zoe Stark. Um, <laughs> in the pantheon of bad wrestling promos, we've seen quite a few. This year, where's my stars? Where's my stars? You don't know me. You don't know me. We've seen some bad wrestling promos this year. Um, Bobby Fish, where's the lie? We've seen some really bad wrestling promos this year. Man, we've seen some bad ones. This one ranks right up there with some of the worst. What makes this one even worse is it was a live in ring promo. And what makes it worse than the other ones is that I did not understand. Like, I understand 100% her content, 
But the way she delivered this was absolutely garbage. No bass in her voice. No strength in her voice at all. She sounded like she was flighty. Um, she had no pro projecting her voice. She didn't do that. She didn't even stand still. It just felt like she was complaining into the phone. Like, it, it was just so weird. I was out for nine months. Nine months I was out. I was out for nine months and I got back. I was out here like a bat out of hell. And it's just, it just sounds like, you know, you know, you're, you listen to a crazy woman on the bus or, you know, a crazy Uber driver or something like that. And they're just kind of rambling into the phone. That's what it felt like. Like, this was a terrible promo. It felt completely unfocused. Even though everything she's saying, to a degree, has some element of truth to it. It it's it just feels like she's giving you a, a the worst like <laughs> it just is the one of the worst promos ever. She didn't lose her train of thought like uh, Marina Shafir. Marina Shafir lost her train of thought. She didn't know what was going on. But did she stumble over her words? I'm talking about Zoe Stark now. Yes, she stumbled over her words at one point. She forgot what she was going to say. Did she say anything with any punch to it? No. All of her digs were subtle and people missed them. Her her performance was just so incredibly boring. It was boring as fuck. It was cringe. It went and that's the thing, it went on for so long. It was 100% cringe. And the audience is booing. But they're not booing the things that she's saying. They're booing her even being up there. It's I'm telling you, it's like Showtime at the Apollo. It's like somebody should have just sent the Sandman out there to with the hook and just grab, snatched her ass off the stage. Because that's what she needed. She needed to be physically removed from the facility for having a, a promo this bad on national television. Vince McMahon was paying for this shit. You know? He still is, because he's a Top investor of this fucking program. He should be calling Tom Michaels on the phone and say, whoever that person is, I never want to see them again. This would be bad enough for me to tell Zoe Stark, baby, we're going to put you on a mask. I'll give you a mute gimmick. All right, we're going to treat you like EC3. You're going to run around in circles with like a red cup or something like that, and you're not going to say anything. We're not, we're not doing it. She does not have heel charisma. She does not have heel personality. She doesn't sound baby faces. She just sounds like a cat lady yelling into the phone. And it didn't make any sense. It was stupid. The content of her promo was thus. She was injured for nine months. When she came back, she was she felt like she was on top of her game. She got injured again in the match with Mandy Rose. Then she got pushed into a tag team with Nikita Lyons. She carried Nikita Lyons, and Nikita Lyons only cares about looking good on Instagram and um, people jacking off to her. While she is all about work ethic, and Nikita Lyons couldn't carry her own work ethic. And that the NXT is not about the future anymore, it's about Zoe Stark. And she says that she's the hunter, she's undeniable, and all this kind of stuff. It's just, that's the gist of it. And uh, I looked at that, and it was like, poor Nikita. Poor Nikita Lyons. I feel so bad for her because she has to feud with this. Which means she's going to be tangling with this for a while. And look, I'm going to be honest with you. Maybe in the ring, Zoe Stark is not going to be that bad. You know, maybe in the ring, Zoe Stark is going to be okay. But any type of promo battle, ooh. Mm, 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 mm. I would definitely try to get out of this. <laughs> if I was... I would definitely try to talk my way out of this one. It's bad, dog. It's bad. Like, this is top-tier, terrible promo material. Like, this is awful shit. And um, you can't beat it with a stick. It's not good. This is this is the shit. This definitely felt like you're watching a bad play. You know, like Shakespeare in an alleyway or something like that. Hark! Who goes there? You know, in the... Like, man, what the... <laughs> One of the worst promos in the history of the business. I don't know what it is about modern wrestlers, but they're not good at talking. The excellent athletes, but they're not good at talking. Jesus Christ, that's the that's the easiest part of the game. All you gotta do is talk. 
All you gotta do is talk, man. I don't know. These pretzels are making me thirsty. All right, Chase University did a promo where um, Andre Chase asked Duke Hudson if he wanted to see him lose. Duke Hudson said that um, he couldn't stand to watch Andre Chase in pain. And so that's why he threw in the towel. Because if he goes down, then the university goes down. And if people think that he's a bad person because he didn't want to watch Chase uh, get hurt, then he'll take it. So um, he's being overzealous, which is actually pretty interesting. You know, I, I don't, I'm, I don't hate this. I don't hate it. They're really doing a good job with Duke Hudson, uh, putting him in the Bodie Hayward spot. All right, Indu Share, uh, Sango and Sango, Sanga and Veer murdered two little guys in what was epic and hilarious fashion. Uh, I think it was Veer that grabbed one of those little dudes and threw him, and the little dude didn't rotate and go all the way over, and instead landed on his shoulder. So it looked like, if you've ever seen Attack on Titan, and like one of those, like one of these guys with these zip lines, and they're trying to attack these giant titans, and they get snatched from the air and crushed, and they get their heads chewed off and something like that. That's what I was watching here. This shit fucking ruled, dog. This ruled ass, right? These fucking guys are huge. One of them's hairy as hell. You know, the other one's covered in tattoos. They're going to go out there and eat a couple of little guys. This is the pro wrestling that I want to see. I'm okay with this. So then after the match, uh, they got on, they got on the mic, which I was a little leery about. Um, Veer speaks perfect English. Sangha does not. Um, but Veer says that, uh, they respect the Creed brothers. Um, and the NXT universe respects the Creed brothers, but they don't get the same respect. They being the Creeds. I mean, they, they being in share don't get the same respect that the Creed brothers get. And the only way for them to get this appreciation, the appreciation that they get in India versus the appreciation they get in the United States. The only way for them to get that respect is for them to, to beat up on the Creed brothers. And if that's what they have to do to get their respect, they're going to get it. They're going to do it. Okay. It was a simple message. Sangha should probably let Veer do the talking, but okay. You know, it's fine. It's okay. Immediately, the Creed brothers had a response saying that they were going to maul and do share. And that they want nobody gets to make a name for themselves on their back. So Ivy Nile steps into the screen and um, with her little girl voice. Saying that the Creed brothers need to focus on being the tag team champions. And they're like, nope, we want to fight Indu Cher. And she's like, I'm pretty sure you guys should focus on being the champion. They're like, nope, we're going to fight Indu Cher. And she was like, well, I'm not going to argue with you guys. You guys got, you guys know what you're doing. But I think you're in the, going down the wrong path. So we see that Ivy Nile is probably about to turn heel and about to continue the breakup of Diamond Mine. As the Creed brothers are going to go on a, a war path to do their own thing and not care about championships, which, you know, Ivy Nile, you've been there for a year now. You should care about championships, too. Um, but she was there because she wanted to hang out with her bud, Tatum Paxley. Tatum Paxley wrestled in the Hartwell and lost. Um, there was no introductions at all in this match. Nobody. They didn't even say what their names were. Um, the lights blinked a little bit. I'm guessing that was part of the gimmick. Anyway. Uh, Indy Hartwell won. She removed Tatum Paxley's mask. Um, Tatum Paxley broke her nose a couple of years, a couple of years, a couple of months ago, maybe a couple of weeks, and has been wrestling under a mask since. So Indy Hartwell took advantage of that and won. Okay, uh, she's still hanging around. Uh, later in the show, Roxanne Perez congratulated Indy Hartwell, which Indy Hartwell graciously accepted, but then criticized her for removing Tatum Paxley's mask, saying that maybe she did a little too much. Andy Hartwell says, look, I'll do anything to get into one of those Iron Survivors matches. And if I have to break somebody's nose, I'll do that. And what do you think, you know, if Tatum Paxley would have broke my nose? So they basically have turning uh, Roxanne Perez into a judgmental little go doofus. Like she's she's judging her friends now. <laughs> you know, she's being judgy and preachy. And that's not a good idea. I understand she wants to be a good guy. But, you know, sometimes you got to let people do what they do, man. Sometimes you got to step aside, let people do what they do. But, um, or you can make a statement like, you know, not the way I would have done it, but congratulations. And it still would have been judgmental, but eventually people like Indy enough where they are not going to take kindly to the constant criticisms from Roxanne Perez. 
Unless you're going to turn her into a preachy, goody two shoes, teacher's pet type of gimmick, you probably should stop. <laughs> you know, probably should stop having her criticize Indy Hartwell's success. You know, let's not do that. The crowd likes Indy Hartwell. Speaking of the crowd likes, Wendy Chu had a promo where she called Cora Jade a salty and petulant child and said that some of the things that Cora Jade said about her last week about her, you know, being um, somebody who wants to be liked and sits by, her, sits by the phone waiting for friends to call her. So some of that stuff wasn't true, but some of it she hasn't heard since high school and it was hurtful, but she doesn't feel ashamed of wanting, liking to have fun and not taking herself so serious. And then um, said that she's going to give Cora J some black eyes. One thing I'll say about Wendy Chu, I hate this gimmick, but I will say this. Um, she's got a nice smile. I uh, will say that. She's got a pretty nice smile. It's a very big, bright smile. And that's good for a baby face. That works. She got a lot of teeth, though. So it's very nice. Uh, Javier Bernal he had a good promo. He talked about not wanting to sit back and be told who he's going to wrestle. So he's going to seize the day. He's going to make the challenges from now on. And he challenged Axiom to a match. He challenged Ilya Dragunov to a match. And he challenged any member of Gallus. Um, as he was doing this, he <laughs> Mackenzie Mitchell kept interrupting him, telling him that Axiom is injured. Then said that Ilya Dragunov is also injured and not medically cleared. And that Gallus is suspended. And, of course, this gave Javier Bernal an opportunity to play off of her by saying that Axiom is a great performer. And if he was a man with any pride, he'd step out and fight him. Then told that Ilya Dragunov, he says, if I got challenged by big body Javi, I'd go back to Germany, too. Even though I think it's supposed to be Russia. But um, who who counts at this point? And um, <laughs> it was so it was funny. It was pretty good. So Javier Bernal thinks that everybody is scared of him and said that uh, it's people like Mackenzie Mitchell that's holding him back. So this is a great promo segment. Big body, Javi. He's pretty funny. He's a funny guy, man. All right. So the Carmelo Hayes Wesley contract signing. This ruled. This was really good. Carmelo Hayes got to fire off a couple of one-liners that were pretty good. The best one being when Carmelo told Wesley, where you where your limit is, is where I start. <laughs> That was good shit. Uh, Trick Williams told him there was no ladder for him to climb. Wesley, of course, yelled at him, said that he played the hand of the universe, dealt to him, and he found peace in knocking out Trick Williams. But now he's a North American champion. He is the real champion, and um, he's going to make do anything to make sure he stays the champion. Uh, they got into a bit of a more argument before Carmelo Hayes told Wesley he was going to First 48 him in front of all of these witnesses. <laughs> oh, shit. Booker T stood in between them uh, and uh, stopped them from there being any violence. There was a couple of Shucky Ducky quack quacks and uh, Booker T's fade fives and all this kind of stuff in here. So it was nice. It was a great promo segment to show off Carmelo Hayes and his charisma and his personality and why he should be on the main roster, you know, doing it big. But unless there's a spot for him, I'm okay with him staying in NXT. You know, he's one of the few guys that I'm okay with him staying in NXT because he can add a lot to the product. He doesn't feel like a ghost around there yet. He's been stuck in this same spot forever, which is not good. Um, and we probably should consider giving him the title of NXT champion. But unless there is a similar spot opened up for him on the main roster, which there is not right now. I mean, Seth Rollins is still kind of working the U.S. title thing. He really just got started. And Gunther is probably going to be Intercontinental champion for now into the future. So there's really nothing for him to do on the main roster except, you know, take his time and develop his character. But um, he's in a prime spot in NXT where he could go, he could be the top guy in NXT shit at this point. So I don't see why they won't move him up. I don't, I don't get that. Uh, Wesley hung in there, but, you know, the gap in, in talent is very wide. And you can look at it and tell that one of these guys is definitely going somewhere. And the other one is definitely there. You know, I'm just mean, just present. You know, he's just... He's in the building somewhere, mopping the floor or something. All right, so we got a promo from Dijak, who said, the truth ain't always so simple. 
But the truth is always simple when he is sitting across the table. So the NXT is a soft society and hard justice is on the way. And I was like, more TNA. More TNA. Hard just TNA hard justice. I don't know. Is this gonna be like Southern Justice? I hope not. I hope it ain't like Southern Justice. I hate Dijack. He sucks. And now he's coming across like Claw from Inspector Gadget. And I'm really not a fan of him. You know, this guy fucking sucks. Brooks and Jensen lose to the Dyad. Right. Good job. Keanu James knocks out uh, Fallon Henley. Or was it the other way around? I think it was the other way around when Fallon Henley knocked out Keanu James. Uh, Jensen got crushed against the announce table, which was wild stuff. I mean, that was crazy. It looked like it hurt. It looked like it hurt real bad. Real, real bad. But um, Schism wins. So it was nothing. This was, of course, uh, a segment that we could have cut out of the show. Along the, you know, with uh, Tatum Paxton and Andy Hart, we just kind of just didn't need it. Uh, we did, did a, a lore segment where we had to explain why Malik Blade wears sweater vests. I don't know why we needed to know why he wears sweater vests, but apparently Shawn Michaels thought we needed to know why this guy decides to wear sweater vests. And so he told us that his dad liked to dress nice. He talked about this, you know, department store that he used to shop at and all this kind of stuff. And his dad ordered him a sweater vest. It was the first thing he ever ordered. And then he had a closet full of them. And his dad passed away. And so now he wears these sweater vests in honor of his dad. Which, you know, it's always good to be a good son. And it's good baby face stuff. But did we really need to know this? Can we have done something like somebody ripped a sweater vest and then he has some kind of emotional reaction to it? Like when they took Bret Hart's jacket. And we had to learn about the lore of Bret Hart's jacket. <laughs> we got to explain clothing. In a mat. Like we, we, really, we really don't though. Like we didn't really need to know the lore of the sweater vest. Could have done without that, you know. But hey, who am I? I'm just, I guess they had to waste some time on this show. But they, they already wasted time because Brooks and Jensen was on it. Those guys fucking blow. You know, they're, they're terrible. Jesus Christ, I, I've hated them from the beginning. Like, I've hated Brooks and Jensen from the beginning, and they have not improved on, they have not proven me wrong. They suck ass hard. Um, I like Fallon Henley, though. I don't, I do like her. All right, we got another Scripps poem. Uh, apparently, Scripps has broken into the PC and will sit around and wait for a week before uh, making themselves known. I think that's the gist of the of the poem. Uh, nobody has any idea who Scripps is supposed to be. Um, everybody keeps saying it's all a Velveteen Dream. I don't want to say that. I think it's probably going to be a female, you know, um, at the end of the day. And it's probably going to be somebody who was in NXT and just wasn't anymore. Or maybe somebody who uh, got moved up to the main roster and uh, disappeared. And we probably forgot they were even up there. So this... Loads of uh, intrigue around scripts, but it's not nearly as much as um, you would think. Like, they've been doing this script stuff for like a month now. And it's not that much of interest around scripts. It's just a lot of people saying like, okay, who is it? And it's probably because they've been doing these sort of mystery things for a while now. You know, so people are just kind of like, yeah, 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 we get it. Come on with it. Who's next? You know. And with them uh, introducing Isla Dawn, that probably threw a lot of people off already, too, because they probably thought it was her. Even though it's a man's voice, that doesn't mean it has to be a man that is uh, doing the break-ins and stuff. It could just be, like, somebody who, um, like, it could be Jenny, let's say. Like, Jenny had a, a man servant named Joseph Connors. And it could have been, like, Joseph Connors reading the notes that Jenny had written. Even though I think Joseph Connors got released and but jenny is still on the rock on the roster uh, i wonder when she's going to come in i know she's in the united states i think she's been hanging out with gunter they're still together so um i think she's in the country but jenny has this great corella deville look to her where she just looks like a mean lady like a like a mean mary poppins like a, <laughs> i like her so much um i really thought she should have been an nxt women's champion or well, the nxt uk women's champion but that's when they were doing the Kaylee Ray should beat everybody storyline, and which was not as fun as it sounded, right? 
which I know it doesn't even sound very fun. Anyway, this was NXT. This was a really good show. Um, back, what's still not back to the NXT uh, 2.0 era that I liked, but they're they're doing some stuff. It's interesting. There's nothing to hate on this show. There's just well, I'm, I was wrong, of course. You you must hate uh, Zoe Stark. That was an awful promo. That was a promo that was so bad as one for the ages. It was legitimately very bad, uh, and it was <laughs> embarrassingly bad. But outside of that, uh, nothing else on the show was like embarrassingly terrible. It was all passable, and some of it was actually quite good. So I thoroughly enjoyed this episode of NXT. But what did you guys think? Like, share, subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later, man. Peace out.